My name is Vijaya Jyotsna and I will be today's event facilitator. Today, our topic will focus on the results of a recent Harris poll about the fear of healthcare costs and avoidance. We will explore how these findings can help organizations identify opportunities for improving health benefits education, outreach and engagement. Before we begin, let's go over a few protocols. Please note that your line will be automatically muted during the webinar. You can send questions at any time during the webinar using the question tab on the side panel. We will address your questions at the end of the presentation. Also, following today's event, we will email a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording of this webinar. I would now like to start by introducing today's speakers. Craig Abrahamson, VP of Employer Solutions at CO Health Analytics. Mr. Abrahamson has over 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry. As the Vice President of Employer Solutions at CO, Craig leads the employer segment supporting the sales and account management teams in the development and delivery of solutions, analytics and concierge services. The majority of Craig's experience has been in strategic leadership roles at major insurance carriers, serving as the principal contact for clients and consultants. Dr. Kevin Keck, Chief Medical Officer, CEO Health Analytics. Dr. Keck has spent the past 25 years as a physician executive and most recently worked with the Permanente Medical Group in Sacramento, California as a palliative care physician. He has also held two CMO positions one at the Providence Health Plans, where he created a value-based benefit design, and the other at Providence Medical Group. And he has also served as Chief of Medicine at Kaiser Permanente. Our third speaker is David Holm, Chief Solutions and Business Development Officer. Mr. Holm is an internationally recognized expert in the field of consumer engagement through programs such as value-based benefits and employee wellness. He joined CEO Health Analytics after more than 25 years with Pitney Bowes Corporation, where he was responsible for introducing their leading-edge programs in value-based wellness and reduced the medical trend by 50% of the industry average each year for 15 years. David has co-authored two leading books on value-based designs which have been read by over 250,000 benefit and health plan executives. So now I think we are finally ready to begin our webinar for today. Let's first welcome Craig Abrahamson. Craig, it's all yours now. Great. Thank you. Good morning and or afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Thank you for joining. To start, we're just going to quickly review the agenda of what we're going to cover today. We'll start by sharing an overview of what we found in our Harris Poll, as well as what it means for you and some recommendations. We'll then follow with Dr. Kevin Keck sharing findings about what it means and what you should consider. And finally, Dave Hahn will share with us some ways or ideas that you can enhance your outreach and engagement. At the end, we will have Q&A where we will answer any of your questions. We will share results from a poll that we are going to take in the middle of the webinar. Follow-up information will be sent, including some links and videos to this presentation, as well as some more detailed information and findings from the poll. And lastly, at the end, we will share some contact information so that if you have some questions that you think of after the session, you'll have the opportunity to know where to find those answers. So to start with, share uh, some highlights from this consumer survey. We conducted the poll through Harris and asked a little over 2,000 adult Americans age 18 or older with an equal number being men and women. The answers that we got back included breakouts by age, gender, household size, marital status, region, income, presence of children, employment status, and education. And this last bullet is really the key, that the results are representative of the U.S. adult population. I'd also like to share that we are considering doing a second survey to see if there's any trends and or changes in what we found from this first survey. 
So overall, what we learned and what we know. We found that people do not understand the healthcare system or the services covered under their plan. Interesting tidbit is that this applied across all age groups, genders, education levels, and income levels. So the issue with the misunderstanding is not specific to any one category, but seems to apply universally. We also found that many people do not understand their cost share responsibilities. The importance of this is understanding how messages need to be communicated and what messages need to be communicated and the fact that they re really need to step back and be at a far more basic level to get at things like co-pays and deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums so people know what their costs are. Because what we have found is that this misunderstanding, not understanding, and fear of what those costs are going to be if they go for care is leading to avoidance of care. Interesting tidbit is that this avoidance of care is equal among those that are healthy as well as those with the chronic condition. So it's not based on what you think the need is based on a health status. The so what to all of this is that there's a big knowledge gap and the misconceptions are leading to bad decisions. If you think about it from that employer's perspective with your workforce, and you're thinking about making more complex decisions like should I consider exchanges, should I go into a value-based care or an ACO type situation, you need to also realize as you're making those decisions that while you're thinking of that next generation solution, there's people who don't understand the current solution. So with that, I'm going to share a little bit more information about the Harris Poll. We worked with Harris Interactive, Inc., who is a public opinion polling organization who specializes in uncovering consumer motivations and behavior. We conducted the poll in October of 2014, which is right around most people's open enrollment time. So again, as you think about the messages you were communicating in October last year, understand that most of those messages were not received or understood as well as may have been hoped. We polled 2,000 plus adults over 18, so we did hit that demographic age group that is making decisions around healthcare and healthcare elections. 90% of those polled had insurance, so these are people living this issue, not watching it from the periphery. And interesting that the poll was conducted online, so when we get to some more detailed results, we're going to see that lots of people don't like to get their information online, and yet they are willing to engage online to answer these questions. So the core question that we asked is, post-Affordable Care Act, how do you feel your understanding of the system and services covered are? We found that 60% did not feel as though they had a better understanding of the health care system post-ACA. That's a majority, so we're not talking about just a few. We also found that 41% are spending more time researching what's covered by the insurance plan. That's not 41% of people doing research, that's 41% of the people doing research spending more time doing that research. Lastly, we found that 38% do not have a good understanding of what health care services are covered under their current plan. These results were independent of education levels, communication means, and support available. So when you look in more detail and think about what the goals of the Affordable Care Act were, they talked a lot about strengthening health care and advancing knowledge and safety. In essence, the promise came into three categories. Make it simple, make it affordable, make it universal. And yet we, what we found very clearly is that 60% do not have a better understanding. Many of those people lack the college degree. So when you think about messages and modes of communication, you need to reduce to that lowest common denominator and make sure that that average person is able to understand the basics. 41% spending more time researching than before. Age groups between 18 to 34, 55 to 64, 
and mostly male. I think we've all seen or believe that in most situations when it comes to health care and health-related decisions, generally the males are not the ones making those decisions for the families, and yet they're the ones doing the research. We found 38% do not understand what's covered under their plan, and this was education neutral. So it's not a matter of that medical literacy or overall education level driving an ability to understand it's across all different education levels. So while the promise may have been about simple, affordable, and universal, the reality is complex, time-consuming, and unclear. When we asked about how consumers want to learn about costs and services, what we found is that 62% go online to do their research. Great sources of information online, the question it leads to is where are they going to get those answers and are they able to go online at any site where they're able to get specifics about their health plan benefits or their health plan programs. On that 41% like to go to member helplines. Not a surprise that of that population, 31% are retired, like to talk on the phone. Question it leads to is do they believe what they're being told on that helpline or are they simply answer shopping? 37% are going directly to the insurance company, mainly the college educated over age 55. Question it leads to is does the insurance company know details about all of the benefit plans that that member has and does that insurance company know about all of the programs? that are available to the member. Thirty-one percent go directly to the doctor as their trusted service to answer questions. Interesting thing, as we're going to see later, many people are not going to the doctors to get the services. So while they feel as though they trust the doctor to give them answers on what's covered, they're not trusting the doctor to go and spend the money to receive the care. So when we talk about understanding costs, 41% of the people polled do not know their out-of-pocket costs for prescription drugs. The majority of these people were age 18 to 34. So these are your future high-cost claimants who are sacrificing compliance today for a fear of cost. We need to break down those barriers and make sure that people are receiving the prescriptions that they need. We also found that 61% do not know the cost for urgent care or walk-in clinic visits. If you look at those average age brackets and compare that to the emergency room utilizers, they're probably going to line up pretty well. So you have people making decisions to go to potentially higher cost services because they feel that they at least know what that cost is going to be as opposed to going to that lower cost service simply because they don't know what those costs are. This is driving the use of lower value services and expense of those higher value services. Answer being needing to find ways to use incentives and or disincentives to improve those decisions. And we are going to talk a little later about what can be done to address this phenomena and improve the decision making. So this fear of costs and avoidance has led to one in five of the people we polled avoiding seeing a doctor within the past 12 months because of cost concern. We have short-term financial decisions being outweighed or given more value than the long-term cost or outcomes both from a financial and a health perspective. The majority of these people were parents, so it leads to the question of what is that next generation learning from a value perspective of health versus dollars. And it leads everybody else to wonder what's that cost of the misunderstanding when we think about our future risk. When we looked at the poll and talked about for those that are not seeing the doctor in the last 12 months, is it just the healthy or what's the influence of those that have a chronic condition prevalent? What we have found in general is about half of the U.S. adults over age 18 have at least one chronic condition, 
And what we found in the poll is that 14% of members with chronic conditions also have avoided seeing doctors in the past 12 months. So you have 20% of the total population, 14% of the population with chronic conditions, very similar results, not seeing doctors because they don't know what it's going to cost them. So you have those decisions being made less on a health need and more on a, I'm not sure what it's going to cost me, so I simply won't go basis. So what this all leads to is a need to rethink how we're communicating, how we're educating, how we're incenting or disincenting the members, and taking into account the influencers that are driving those decisions. Things like education, age, income, gender, and their condition status to help them understand first how the healthcare system works and what's covered under their plan, and then second, what their cost share is going to be. Because what we have found now is that not understanding the system or their cost share responsibilities is leading to more research, which is a good thing if it improves the education level, except that we're also finding from a decision-making standpoint it's leading to more avoidance of care. This highlights the need to think and address the consumer differently. And Dr. Kevin Keck is going to spend some time walking through exactly how we can do that. Craig, before we get to, uh, uh, to Kevin, and this is uh, Dave Hahn, uh, you've shown us a lot of data uh, from Harris, a lot of concerns that may be uh, raised by the data. Uh, what was the surprise to you uh, when you saw the results from the, from the Harris survey? I think what surprises me the most is that you have people doing more research, which would lead you to believe they're learning more, they're finding more information, they're getting more advice from a source that they feel is a trusted source, and yet you still have 20% of the population avoiding care because they don't know what the cost is. So all those folks that may not be getting the right care could be, and this is a a bad term, but could be more higher risk of walking time bombs you know, later on. They, yeah, they, they will be. And in, in a lot of those situations, they already know they've got a condition that needs to be managed. They know they should be taking a prescription. They know they should be going to their doctor at least once a year. But because they're not sure what it's going to cost them today at the time of the service, they're willing to, to roll the dice and figure longer term, they're still going to make out better. So Kevin, from a health, a health system perspective, from your days at a large um, staff health plan and, and a health system, uh, what surprised you in the data? Well, uh, two things. Um, and let me look at it from uh, um, an additional viewpoint of the employer. Um, that 14% uh, of patients that really need care uh, aren't going and getting the care because they don't understand the costs. Then the other thing is um, those, those patients that need episodic care uh, are not getting it to a substantial degree because they don't understand the cost, and then that leads to uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, and, then, and from a provider standpoint, uh, the patients come in sicker, and when they do that, uh, uh, they may need uh, ED visits and hospitalization. So um, uh, it's uh, sobering to see these data. Thank you, Kevin. So let me uh, talk about uh, you know what to do, and uh, when when one gets um, a, a set of data like these that um, uh, tell you that you know employers aren't getting their full money's worth uh, for a large uh, spend, um, and it's hurting the health of the workforce, uh, you want to do something. And uh, when we here uh, look at uh, you know what what can be done. Uh, there's nine things that the employer or the um, health plan, uh, the uh, health insurance company can do uh, that will change behavior of the patient or the physician. So we're picking out those that apply to this um, uh, data set. And uh, first, 
uh, one is benefit design and educating the employee about that. And uh, it's clear that um, members, uh, employees, need education more than once a year. Um, what is uh, helpful is this can be done in a variety of ways. And it need not be expensive. You know, think about uh, a refrigerator magnet, magnet or a pocket card or uh, putting a, uh, a website uh, on the employee's computer that they can go to uh, so that they'll know, you know, what is, what is the benefit and uh, what can they do. Now, uh, this education hey, Kevin? can't... Yes? Uh, can I stop yes. you for one quick second? We're getting some feedback yes. um, from a volume perspective that some people may be having some difficulty hearing, and I want to make sure that everybody hears the great advice and information okay. that you're sharing. Can I All ask right. that you either get closer to a phone or use a different headset or speak a little louder? Yeah. Um, okay. I'll, I'll speak a little louder. How about that? Can you hear me? Can you hear great. me better now? Thank you. I'm I'm closer to the microphone. Okay. So um, uh, with the benefit design, uh, the point I made is uh, education needs to be done more than once a year. Uh, it, it can be done in a variety of ways. It needs to be readily available. Uh, it can be targeted uh, so that uh, those members that have a chronic condition, uh, uh, there can be uh, some extra effort made so that they understand uh, what their benefits are. So um, are, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, second uh, area of intervention or a lever is uh, chronic condition management. And uh, uh, this uh, involves uh, knowing uh, uh, which uh, employees have a chronic condition, which can be done in a variety of ways. Um, and then uh, getting them into a chronic condition uh, uh, enrollment and completing that education. So uh, case finding is done, like I said, a variety of ways. It's, this can be done from health risk assessment, claims data, uh, demographics, a variety of ways. Um, the uh, intervention with chronic condition management is education of the uh, member about their condition, motivating them that they can do something about it, uh, and the empowerment that uh, they they can uh, call the doctor and uh, make an appointment. And um, you know, one example of this is um, the need to uh, coach the member that this is how you call the doctor. And uh, you uh, tell them that uh, you want an appointment today and that uh, you need a callback uh, today. Otherwise, you're going to need to uh, call them back in an hour. So, so uh, what we uh, uh, would want to coach the member is uh, not to accept, uh, I'll see you in three days, for example. And then uh, at, at the uh, employer level, uh, what can be um, done is educating uh, the membership about uh, what happens when you don't engage in care of your chronic condition. And, and that educational effort uh, can have a measurable outcome. Um, getting uh, compliance, uh, that is member behavior, uh, to uh, take care of themselves, uh, incentives, uh, can be used, and uh, what this looks like is a reward for getting appropriate care. And in the workplace, uh, you know, this can be um, uh, like uh, uh, getting them to fill out the health risk assessment, uh, uh, paying them dollars or points uh, for uh, uh, seeing the doctor if they have a chronic condition uh, or a decrease in their health impact plan premium uh, uh, based on getting appropriate care, et cetera. You, you know how to do that. Uh, this also can be targeted uh, to those members that have the most need. In other words, um, uh, those uh, employees that have a chronic condition uh, may be eligible for uh, a uh, $25 incentive, uh, and that need not be uh, across the board uh, with all employees. Um, so it can be targeted. And then high value services uh, are encouraged. And these are services 
uh, where care for a chronic condition like asthma or diabetes or hypertension or hyperlipidemia, et cetera, uh, those uh, uh, care of those services uh, has an incentive. And it, and it can be simple like points uh, that can be redeemed in a, uh, in a catalog. Um, lastly, uh, providers can be engaged uh, in this. Uh, and uh, providers can have their education and incentives. Um, contracts, this is not what the employer does, but what the uh, health plan does, uh, the employer can ask for this, um, is uh, paper outcomes um, so that uh, when the uh, provider, provider group, or ACO uh, has uh, measured outcomes that you want, uh, for your diabetics or your asthmatics, such as uh, control or medication when indicated, uh, or uh, control of the five uh, diabetes measurements uh, as measured, um, then uh, that uh, uh, will have measured outcomes. And then uh, providers uh, can have your employees uh, 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 attributed to them, and uh, those providers can be incentivized uh, to bring those uh, employees in, uh, to their office uh, for care. Um, and again, uh, this can be uh, targeted uh, to members with uh, chronic conditions so that uh, you, uh, you uh, care for the uh, sickest cohort in your uh, membership, uh, which will consume 80% of the spend. So now what we'd like to do is take a poll and find out uh, uh, in the field uh, what uh, you are seeing as interventions in your own um, uh, area. So uh, please fill this out. How many of these interventions are being done by you or um, your health insurance partner? Some good response coming in from the poll now, and uh, we'll close the poll in about three seconds. So uh, let's see how much more we can. Okay. Okay. So now the poll is closed, and let's look at the results of the poll. So we yeah, have you know, the highest uh, at thirty-eight percent uh, who have said three or four uh, interventions, and uh, we have. Um, zero percent who said one and uh, twelve percent who said none. So, uh, Kevin, would you like to comment on these results, please? Well, uh, I, what, what's interesting is uh, those of you, a third of you, uh, check none or don't know. And uh, you know what what uh, strikes me uh, is the, the uh, uh, putting on the list of things to do. Uh, when you're negotiating uh, with your uh, health insurance companies um, that uh, you want uh, to see some effort uh, and you want to understand uh, the effort being done to uh, educate your employees about what's going on. I'm pleased to see uh, that 38 percent of you uh, had uh, three or four of these interventions going. Um, when we asked uh, health plans, uh, the same uh, uh, questions, uh, we found that 41% uh, uh, said that uh, they were doing three or four, and 6% uh, 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 were um, one or zero. So, so uh, it's interesting that that part matched. Uh, but um, you know this can be uh, written down in your uh, set of questions when you do your negotiation uh, with your health plan next time. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, we will now continue with our webinar. Now, um, of the uh, interventions that. Uh, you can do. Uh, they all rely on uh, data and analytics to some degree, uh, sometimes um, uh, minimal, sometimes substantial. Um, and uh, what we'd like to talk about here is uh, how you use the analytics uh, 
uh, to improve the outreach education and engagement of your employees uh, with their health care uh, and the understanding of their health insurance. And uh, the communication uh, re-strategy uh, we talked is uh, help them onboard uh, more effectively on how to use the system. And we said that there needs to be uh, more than once a year education with that. Um, uh, technology can help in outreach to spouses, um, and it's the woman in the family unit who uh, usually is the driver of healthcare decisions. And uh, there's technology on how to uh, engage that person, uh, such as um, uh, uh, educational efforts uh, through an application on the smartphone or a website. Uh, or uh, postcards or mailings. And then another thing that can be done, like we mentioned, is uh, show the impact of non-engagement. And uh, you know, let your new employees, uh, uh, where they get their health plan, their health care um, um, benefits explained, and then even existing employees. So here's what happens uh, if you uh, have a chronic condition and don't get care. And here's what happens if you don't go to a doctor and you have an asthma attack, for example. Um, next is uh, a consumer segmentation, that is uh, taking a look at uh, uh, the uh, various components in the uh, uh, consumer uh, body, such as uh, the uh, young new worker or the uh, active family, uh, and uh, each of these segments uh, behaves differently. Um, if you have an outreach operation, uh, technology can streamline that uh, to um, um, uh, come up with a spectrum of outreach uh, that has other lower cost interventions besides a nurse or live worker phone call. Um, the uh, communication uh, can be based on these consumer segments. Uh, for example, uh, if a uh, consumer is cost conscious, uh, then the encouragement uh, would be to uh, uh, see a primary care physician and uh, let that primary care physician uh, uh, do the best they can and educate that member that uh, uh, brand drugs uh, are uh, one-fifth or less of the cost um, I'm sorry, generic drugs are one-fifth uh, or less of the cost of a brand drug, um, and those would be segmented based on the, on the uh, demographics. And then um, the uh, health risks and condition prevalent can be predicted uh, within the uh, consumer segmentation. Um, with uh, uh, some analytics about the consumer, um, you uh, likely, your uh, health plan partner, would do what's called closed loop analytics, where you uh, take a look at a uh, sick cohort um, and uh, take a look at the gaps in care, um, make uh, an intervention uh, based on uh, how easy is it to close that gap and, and what do you get for closing that gap. Go ahead and do that. Uh, put those uh, interventions uh, into the analytic, and then go back and uh, uh, look at the same cohort again and see where you are and see what you do then. And it is about uh, looking at the gap in care uh, and how how is it going to improve the health of the patient by closing that gap? For example, in asthma, uh, does the patient have a control or medication? Hugely helpful. And uh, how e easy is it to intervene in that? Um, and uh, that would be based on uh, the um, uh, member understanding uh, what the benefit is and, and uh, how they can go about it. And then lastly, uh, technology itself and that um, uh, can be used to improve um, uh, engagement. And uh, the example would be uh, an email intervention versus a phone text intervention versus a, uh, um, a uh, voicemail uh, versus a postcard uh, versus a live call. So technology can help with that. Uh, technology can uh, evaluate 
uh, to a high precision, if you do ABC, uh, what is the outcome on quality measurements and your medical loss ratio, which translates to your spend. And then uh, technology can create um, dashboards with multiple data points so you can know where to push. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and this is uh, Dave Hom. I just wanted to give uh, the audience uh, some of the frameworks in which we're seeing many of our customers use uh, to help them think through solutions that can help them bend medical trends. So this uh, first piece around consumer segmentation, part of which Kevin talked about, is how do you begin thinking about how people use the healthcare system? So it's profiling of individuals using data and how they will end up using specific types of services. And then defining within each of the segments ways in which you can actually engage with members in a proactive way to drive certain behaviors. So we think the new world is all about consumer engagement aligned to physician engagement. So if you look to your left, we got the segments. Uh, these are one through eight, ranging from entry level singles, cost conscious, value driven, active families, sedentary families, healthy baby boomers, and chronic olders, older adults. These populations all exist within your employer base. And then the question then is, is how do you align the data to the right, which is demographic data, age, sex, uh, marital status, educational level, to economic status? It looks at the industry in which you work in, income levels. Uh, whether they're in rural areas or urban areas, how they uh, use their disposable income to purchase materials. And then uh, using claims data, what types of risk do they bring? Uh, what's the expectations for emissions for both inpatient ER and remissions? And more than, and then more importantly then is what's the preferred mode of communications in reaching those individuals? So for example, Craig you know, may be a value-driven uh, uh, member but he prefers getting text messages versus Dave, who may be a healthy baby boomer, and I might prefer receiving information from a call center. So each of us reacts differently to different modes of communications that drive different behaviors. And so this, what I call core asset of building analytics off of the data uh, to drive uh, outcomes or interventions by the employer has really great value. So next slide shows you then is by taking these different segments, you can then look at um, what's the impact of risk by those segments. So if I'm young, healthy, uh, and uh, entry level singles, I'm young, healthy, but I have an active lifestyle, I might be more prone to ER utilization because of accidents, injuries, and falls from exercising. And so uh, then you want to create an intervention to show them that urgent care centers can be more value because uh, it's lower cost. And it goes back to Craig's original comment, his slide, that people don't know the cost of an urgent care center. So that gives you the opportunity then to reduce the utilization of these avoidable services as a way to bend the trend. So on the next slide, we then go through, and this is a little bit of a busy, but it's really about a process, is how do you begin thinking about aligning all of your programs holistically? So you look at data, you got traditional claims data, and you got non-traditional data, which is consumer data, EMR data, call center data. And what this does is it enriches a patient profile. For each of our employers, each uh, employer gets, for their employees and co-dependents, a member profile. In there, we can then provide deep insights. And then we also can predict probabilities for risk, uh, today and probably a risk tomorrow. What we do and what we also develop then is indices that shows um, what what gaps in care may be, may be uh, uh, doable, closable, and what's the value of those gaps. So then the segmentation then is, you know, not all people are created equal. So you want to be able to then figure out how do I identify people based on risk high, medium, and low. And then how do I I'll have my health plans align their resources to each of these different what I call buckets. So it allows the employer then to create service level agreements uh, so that when someone goes from my medium risk 
to high risk how they reshift uh, the resources internally. So it's a an, uh, so it's a data point that says that for a high risk patient, they see on average a physician 90 minutes a year. Uh, they see on average a pharmacist 90 minutes a year. So for a total 180 minutes. How do you create interventions that engages members uh, that uses the combination of technology and other assets. So then you get into the last column, which is how do I effectively use mail, email, text, call centers to uh, uh, reach the member in the time period in which they want to be reached to create an effect. And so as you plan for it, then, uh, then it's how you monitor, how do you track this, and most employers uh, say, well, if I, if I knew that I was missing my targets in, in, in the end of April, they've got eight months in which to recover. So they could be more proactive with uh, new programs, different communications that they can uh, use with their care management companies and their employers and physician groups. So at the end of all this, it's all about measuring outcomes and the return on investments. The next couple of slides is just a way which uh, we think, which is, at, uh, and this gives you at the member level, everything we capture at the member level. The member's address, phone number, gender, uh, we capture their risk, capture all their activities, and then we also then create, what's the probability for member one to be admitted to the emergency room or inpatient visit? And then two is, uh, what gaps do they have and what's the uh, interviewability score that can uh, have a material impact on the reductions of ER visits and inpatient visits, which are expensive? And then lastly, on the next chart, uh, we then look at their educational levels. We look at urban versus uh, rural. We now have the purchasing data. And then we say, is it actually doable? So, so Craig comes in, and he's got six gaps. One of the gaps is a medication gap. But uh, Craig makes twenty-four thousand dollars a year, lower pay, and at two thousand about two thousand dollars a month, if the drug costs hundred dollars, uh, Craig's not going to refill his medication uh, nine t nine months out of twelve. Therefore, he'll have uh, he'll become high risk over time. So this is the way in which uh, many many of our employers are beginning to think. So I just want to give you that framework on uh, possible ways that you can use data to drive interventions and then to hold your uh, health plans and your care management companies accountable through service level agreements. Thank you very much, uh, Dave, and thank you very much to all the speakers for your valuable insights. Um, now let's move on uh, to some questions. If you have not already uh, submitted your questions, please, uh, please feel free to continue to submit your questions via the question tab on the side panel. Uh, if we do not get to all of your questions today, we will definitely address them via email following this webinar. Uh, we have one question now, uh, which is, uh, did you ask if they understood ACA plans or the plan offered to them, an employer plan? Craig, uh, yeah, so this is Craig. The answer to that is that we asked about their plan. So we weren't specific to it being part of ACA or an exchange or an employer plan. By proxy, there were more employed than unemployed in our survey. So it would lead you to believe that most of those benefit offerings were an employer-sponsored plan but we did not, did not ask specifically to rate an employer-sponsored plan because we didn't want to lose the feedback from those who have an alternative coverage. Thank you, Craig. Uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, someone has asked, should we use incentives or disincentives? And uh, if yes, how do we measure the use of incentives or disincentives? Dave, would you like to take the question or Craig? Yes, this is Craig. It, it, it's one of those that everybody's got to make their own decisions in terms of what a population is going to react to. My experience from what I've seen employers do and based on the feedback that we got, 
I think I would recommend starting with an incentive as opposed to a disincentive. It seems as though the unsurety about what care is going to cost is driving negative decision making. So to add a disincentive or a penalty would just give somebody the opportunity to balance out, I know what my penalty is going to be, I don't know what that health care is going to cost me, so I'll just go with the known penalty as opposed to the unknown penalty. And until we can get everybody at a point where they are making the right decisions, steering them with the incentives, I think we need to promote the, the positive means of influencing decisions. For the second part of that around the measurement, it's, it's an overtime thing, taking a look at the risks and the condition status and the cost and the compliance of members who are doing the activities to get the incentives compared to those that are not, and then track over time. Uh, we've looked into this in a couple of specific situations and found that the people getting the incentives were actually higher risk, higher utilizers, higher cost members. Um, but when we looked at the trends of those members versus the members not doing what they needed to do to get incentives over two, three, and four years, we found that their trends were much lower than those that did not do what they should have. Well, thanks, Greg. Um, we have a question which I guess uh, Dave should be able to answer. With regard to text messaging, can you speak to HIPAA? Sure. Uh, so the, uh, HIPAA is a, uh, um, a interesting uh, dilemma, which is how do you communicate uh, sensitive medical information to a patient? So we work with a number of plans and employers in uh, using text messaging because it's cost effective to reach members. And the way we do that is we send the alert uh, to the member on their text and says you've got a health and wellness alert. You uh, member clicks on that on that link and takes them to the website. Then they enroll they they then put in their security, go to the website, uh, and then they within the within the website then there, there'll be a message, you have a health health and wellness alert, you click on that again and you put in your passcode to see the actual alert. So the word might say, you know, you need uh, time to refill your medication. It's also oh, it's time to uh, uh, take your annual physical or your mammogram, pap smear, whatever the alert might be. So it allows uh, for security in that manner. Great, Dave. Uh, we have another question. Um, were you able to identify groups? who had high deductible plans and also had a maintenance or preventative drug list in place that bypassed the deductible and did that make a difference? Sure. Uh, and work with a number of our uh, clients uh, who have put in high deductible plans. What we've seen is initially is, is a dampering uh, on utilization. So things like office visits, you know, drugs, because back to Craig's original uh, data point is that people don't know what it costs. When they do pay for it, they realize that it's expensive, even though there might be savings accounts built in there. So what we've seen is that uh, many of the employers have put in maintenance prevention drugs, which is allowed under the uh, uh, under the legislation as preventive care uh, that's pre-deductible, and so those are then covered as a co-payment. And it, and and the answer is it, it has made a difference in compliance because that addresses the issue of, of, uh, whether, uh, of whether cost for medications uh, is, a, is a barrier to access medications. And there's also uh, mail order versus uh, retail, and there's incentives that many employers built in there for uh, mail order versus retail. Well, uh, Kevin mentioned there were nine levers. Uh, you only talked about four. Uh, can you uh, kind yeah. of uh, expand on yeah. that? Yes, I can. Um, go ahead and uh, put that slide up. Um, when, when one is managing a population, either as an employer or uh, as a health plan, um, there's uh, a limited number of interventions that can be done, and it's helpful 
to know what they are. And uh, when there's a problem, uh, like we discussed today, um, what I found helpful when I was uh, managing my population was uh, uh, getting this list out and then uh, taking the problem and comparing it to the intervention uh, that could be done. And so um, uh, I was always asked, you know, what are you going to do about this? And uh, these are the things that uh, can be done. And we talked about, um, well, uh, uh, we, we talked about some of these, but uh, the nine R, uh, the contracting uh, function, which is you know done usually by the health plan, and uh, that includes the unit cost and choice of network, and in this is uh, gain sharing arrangements uh, as a high impact uh, benefit design, uh, which the employer is uh, very involved with uh, uh, in the design. Uh, has a high impact on cost. Um, prior authorization, uh, the mother may I, uh, when it has to be done, uh, it uh, can have a moderate to high impact depending on uh, which service is being authorized. And then uh, patient education with or without incentive we talked about today. Now, uh, these four uh, usually are doable uh, in a risk taker's existing uh, infrastructure. Now, um, the next five that we talk about uh, requires some additional cost. And um, uh, the uh, next one is capitation, that is pushing risk uh, to the entity that's delivering the care. Um, and that has a high impact uh, because they are managing the dollars much more closely. Um, the added cost is moderate because the analytics have to be uh, pristine uh, to get the provider to accept what's going on. Uh, claims audit uh, is um, important because 8% uh, of claims are incorrect or fraudulent and uh, correcting that has uh, a big outcome and there's moderate cost associated with that. Um, physician data feedback with or without incentive, in other words, for this is pay for performance or, or uh, sending physicians profiles. And um, physicians look at these, uh, uh, trust me, and uh, they uh, need to have them uh, uh, presented uh, with uh, pristine uh, data. And uh, added cost is moderate, um, and the uh, outcome is moderate to high, depending on uh, whether you uh, pay the physician uh, dollars uh, for uh, the behavior. Um, next is uh, concurrent review in the hospital, and this can be done telephonically uh, or on site. Um, moderate impact on length of stay, depending on what your contracts are, uh, but um, the uh, uh, strategy of articulating with case management uh, is the opportunity here. And added cost is uh, moderate, uh, depending on how many nurses uh, you employ to do that. And then case and disease management um, of uh, managing the chronic conditions, uh, uh, educating, motivating, and empowering the member uh, to take care of their illness um, uh, has uh, high impact, uh, measurable outcomes, uh, but also has a, a higher added cost. And uh, when one, one looks at, you know, what can you do, uh, the interventions will fit into one of these categories. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, we are now at the end of our webinar, and uh, thank you all our, uh, all our speakers again and to our audience. A reminder that we will be sending a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording of this webinar within the next few days. The full survey results are also available upon request. If any of you have any more questions about this webinar or the survey, please feel free to contact Craig Abrahamson. His contact details are on the screen. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.